And tonight, pick back up in our survey, ha ha ha, of the Pentateuch. Survey is when you kind of look over something quickly. This isn't exactly that. We're picking up at chapter 25 of Exodus. We'll read the first nine verses. And it's a fairly brief section. So what uh, courageous student in tonight's class will volunteer to read those first nine verses? The longer we wait... Oh, Judy, all right. That's right, that's right. Exodus 25, 1 through 9. Very good. The Lord instructed Moses to raise a blank from among the Israelites. Contribution. Yes, Mike? Okay. Now this is different. Having a question before we start the, the, the answering. Did you hear porpoises, porpoise skins, or was it badger skins? Okay. If, if you look up the word, and, and you can do this with the Strongs, you don't have to know Hebrew, but you can go to your translation, the King James, and find out what that word is, and go look it up in, in the Hebrew, and it is a word that's more likely to be ram's skins, but it's... It's not as distinct. One of the problems we have, not with language necessarily, but with zoology, when you go back in time, not all the animal names were exactivities. Just like, when was the first English dictionary created? Anybody know? Who did that? Daniel Webster. Daniel Webster wrote the first English dictionary, and that's what standardized spelling in the English language. Now, how long had people been speaking English? Well, a long time. But the, the spelling wasn't standardized until he wrote the dictionary. It's kind of the same thing with animals. In other words, the bottom line is some translators, some scholars will look and say, well, that, that's porpoise. And another, another will say, well, that's badger. How many of you, anybody have badger in your translation? Okay, Carolyn's got badger. Some will have uh, sea cow. Yes, porpoise but it's probably more likely a ram or a goat. No way to tell that I have been able to find for sure. Well, no, they're not. And not does the sea cow either. So there is a sea cow, but what she's saying is that the, the, the porpoise and the badger aren't even close. Well, the sea cow is not close to that either. Yeah, you got to come to America. Uh, order them online, Amazon or something maybe. But but these people would have known what those were. There would have been no question in the minds of the Israelites. They wouldn't have gone, what's that? We don't know what God's asking us to do. They understood exactly what God was asking them to do, what he was asking them to use. We'll look at it now and we'll go, well, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what that word means, but they knew. And that's that's what was given. Never seems to be any kind of an issue with them. It's always us trying to understand this uh, this particular word. Good question, though. Yes. 
All right. I don't know, but it wasn't very long. They probably brought it with them. There's no... Well, would you? You see, we, we might project that because, well, that's, that's the way it is now, but well, we have no idea. That, that could well be. At any rate, when God asked for these things, he asked for these because these were things that were available to the people. However they were available, I have no idea. But would they have been available? They, they would have been available. PJ. Yes. They, they took spoils from Egypt. Maybe, or who, who knows how many they might have gotten oil in between those times they're closing in on Mount Sinai if you if we go back to, well not, not closing in but they have closed in on Mount Sinai because chapter 24 was uh, was there they had to go up on Mount Sinai and that's where they ratified the covenant that God gave Moses on Sinai so they had closed in they were there and now God says, here's how I want you to build a sanctuary. All of this is coming from Mount Sinai. It was a box. That's not the same word, because I thought, well, that, that's probably the same word that it was for the ark that Noah built. That's, it's a different word. This is a, a container, but what the word actually means is gathering. It was the idea... If, if you had a box, why would you have a box? Well, you wanted to put something in it. And that's, that's evidently how they came up with the idea for the word box. It was a gathering of things. And as we understand now, of course, we're going to read in a little bit what was supposed to be put in there initially, but the box did become a gathering place for the things God wanted in there. And certain things, only certain things, were gathered to that box. All right, uh, the Lord instructed Moses to raise a contribution from among the Israelites for the building of the tabernacle and its furnishings. Everyone was to give as their blank moved them. Heart. Therefore, this was not a mandatory offering, but one of blank, blank. Free will is what I would put in there. I wanted to make that point. God did not say, here's your first law, make a contribution. The first contribution that Israel gave was a free will contribution. It was to be made as every man's heart moved him. In other words, God's saying, you look back over what I've done for you, and if you recognize that as valuable, if you recognize your relationship with me to be valuable, if you recognize what I've done for you in the past several weeks, months, however long this took, then make a contribution for the tabernacle. That's what this was all about. Not a matter of law, but a matter of free will as people's hearts moved them. God told Moses that they were to construct the sanctuary that he might blank among them, dwell among them. And here's the thought question. Do you believe God said this so that the Israelites would understand that he would actually dwell in the tabernacle? I don't think so either. There's the idea that if the tabernacle is here, in, in their minds, they would have understood, okay, there is the, the presence of God. 
I don't know how much detail God wanted to go into with them at this point to explain, I'm not actually going to live there. But I want you to understand that that tabernacle means I'm with you. What was it that Paul said on Mars Hill when he talked about God there to those people? What do you say about temples made with hands? And God doesn't live in temples made with hands. He made everything. He doesn't have any needs that we can fulfill with our hands. Nevertheless, what is God's temple today? Our body, what else? God, God dwells in two temples that are the same temple. <laughs> Okay, pause here, put a marker in Exodus chapter 25 and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter Look at verse 16. Do you not know? Is he talking singularly or plurally? Who's he writing to? Writing to the church at Corinth. And so he's asking the saints at Corinth, do you not know that you are a temple? In English, it's singular because in the Greek, it's singular. A temple of God. So what's the temple of God here? It's not a trick question. It's the church. The church is the temple of God. God lives in his temple, which is the church. His son bought the church with his blood, and God lives in the temple. Now that's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Go to chapter 6. Somebody read verse 19. Okay. Talking to individual saints about this problem of fornication. This was a big problem in Corinth because that was part of their religion. You, you had the idolatrous temples. You go up there and they had the temple prostitutes and you committed fornication with the prostitutes and that was part of the worship. And from that fornication, the gods were to look down on that and get excited and make all the crops fertile, make all the animals fertile. Let's talk about twisted thinking, but if you're the devil and you want people to be immersed in sensuality and to think that sensuality is religion, here's a great way to do it. You talk about get up on Sunday morning and say, let's go to church. Every man in town is going to want to go to church because it's totally sensual. The only men who wouldn't want to do that are men who are thinking, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this. And people know. We know instinctively that some things are wrong. And so there were people who would listen to Paul when he preached. And that's why the church got established in Corinth, because people rejected these kinds of ideas. Not everybody did, but enough did that the church was established in a strong church. And what Paul is saying here is, your body, your individual body, is a temple of God. He lives in you as an individual. He lives in his church as a whole, and the, the whole church is his temple, but so is the individual. Each one of us are temples of the Holy Spirit. That's the point that Paul's making here. So we're looking back at the tabernacle that God said, I want you to build this tabernacle, this tent, and here's how I want you to do it, and here's why I want you to do it, so that Israel will understand that I live with them. Aren't you glad that we don't have to have a tabernacle today? If we want, we can have a church building. We have a very nice church building, but God does not have church buildings built so that people will understand he lives among them. He says, I'm living in you. We carry God with us everywhere we go. Whether we go as a group 
or whether we go as individuals, we carry the Lord with us because He lives inside of us. Observations, questions, comments? Okay, back to Exodus 25. Twenty-five nine is the first place where God tells Moses to build the tabernacle and its furnishings according to the blank that he would show them. Pattern, pattern, pattern. Write that down, highlight it, mark it, whatever, because this is going to be the recurring idea for the rest of Exodus. All right, let's read uh, verses 10 through 22. I need somebody to read 10 through 16. Who will take that section? Carolyn? And 17 to 22. We'll read 17 to 22. Okay, Terry. All right. Yes. Excellent. Yeah, good question. I have to admit, when I now picture the ark, it's much like what they showed. Whether the actual ark was, was like that or not, I haven't a clue. Oh, okay. I didn't really look at it. <laughs> yeah, pull it out and look at it. Yeah. Uh, I didn't look to see if the rings were in exactly the place that it says here, but this says on, on the feet or on the, the pedestals or whatever those would have been that the ark would have rested on towards the floor. It gives the dimensions, and, and that's part of our question, so we know about what size it was. Um, we know that cherubim had wings, but if we read from uh, Exodus chapter 1, not Exodus, Ezekiel chapter 1, where Ezekiel saw cherubim and described them, we know that they had, the ones he saw, had four wings. Maybe there were some cherubim that only had two, but that's what it looks like is pictured here. I'm thinking this. We read in Genesis, and I don't know if you remember this far back in our study, but God gave abilities to people as they came into being. He gave abilities in working metal and different kinds of things like that. And I'm thinking that God somehow enabled them to know what they needed to build to fulfill his desire for cherubim. The reason we don't have descriptions, I don't know. But I already know that with what little we know of angels, there was very nearly an angel religion uh, a few years ago because everybody was had angels all over the place, depictions of angels. And they weren't actually depictions of what we have described in the Bible because those would be very, very hard to reproduce. Am I making any sense at all? 
Am, am I in, in any way answering your question? <laughs> That's what I was afraid of. <laughs> right? Now for us, we... Exactly. They knew how to do this stuff. That's why when we uncover things that are thousands of years old and we look at them and go, look how beautiful that is. Look at the intricacy of the work and the design. They knew how to do these things because they had artisans. They had craftsmen. And you don't have to go back thousands of years. You go back to the hills of Appalachia or Appalachia, as what's his name called it, and you'll find people back there who are artisans and craftsmen. They'll go out at night and they'll kill a possum and they'll bring him back and dress his hide and make a banjo out of it. And we're thinking, how do you how do you make a banjo with that? And they'll take wood and they'll put it in a in a trough and soak it for several days. I'm not going to tell you how they how they brown gun barrels, but they'll soak it in water several days and make it pliable and they'll make all kinds of crazy things. They they do stuff because that's what they had to do back in the day. A lot of those skills are lost to us. How many of you have gone to Branson and you've watched them do things at Branson and you go, man, who figured that out? Well, it's amazing what people can do when they don't have any other way to do it. Who would have thought of making soap by rendering down a hog and taking the lard and mixing it with ash? I mean, that's, that's what soap was. And it got you clean. It worked. Left your skin a little dry, but it worked. So, so we're talking about things, and you and I read these, and we go, how in the world did they do that? Well, they knew. They understood. How did David sling a stone and hit that Goliath right in the forehead? Well, there are other places that tell us that the king had slingers that could throw a stone within a hair's breadth. That's pretty close. Even if that's an exaggeration, that's pretty close. Okay. And it's like pointing your finger, I'm told. Uh, yes, Mike. Yes. It says put it on one side of it. In other words, it, it, if you put casters on a box, you could say two casters are on one side and two casters are on the other. They might be on the bottom of the box, but they're still on that side. And all... You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark with them. It, it was, yes. Ark?
Well, if we took these details and, yeah, if. Now, now you all know what you call what we're doing right now, don't you? This is this is called speculation, and I, I don't know who had their hand up first. I think it was Linda and then PJ. They have found implements made of iron that are harder than the iron we have now. Who knows, as Linda is saying, what processes they knew about were available to them, what they could have added to that gold to, to make it catalyze, if that's the word, that would not have left any kind of an impurity in it but would have caused it somehow to, to become more hardened than it was. I, I don't know. I don't know. And that's the same answer. <laughs> Absolutely. And and they didn't seem to have any question about it. And there, there's no record here of Moses saying, but wait a minute, God, we've never seen a cherub beam. How do we know how to make it something we've never seen? Guys with the bows and arrows, fat little babies with wings. Yeah, well, that's that's what we call cherubic. But but you look at Ezekiel chapter one, and that's not what he describes there. Well, here's here's the thing. I I don't think anybody's questioning God. We're just reading this, and we're fascinated with this because at least I am. I'd like to know exactly what it was like. And I read this and I have the same reaction. Man, what would it have looked like? Did it have any trim work on it? It doesn't say anything about trim work, but when I picture it, I don't picture just a plain square box. I picture something with maybe a little ornamentation. It had feet on it. What what kind of feet? What that? Had what? Oh, okay. Yes. But what did that look like? Yes, and we've all got some kind of a picture of it, but until we have an actual picture that says this is what the end looked like, uh, here are the dimensions of the end, even if we had that. And how much detail would God have to go into to give us an exact picture of the ark? I don't think we care that much now. I mean, it, we're curious about it, but bottom line is tomorrow's going to come. We're going to have to go to work or go to school, and we're going to... Be thinking about life. Yeah. I, I don't have any doubt that when Moses brought this down and gave it to the artisans that were among the Israelites, that they said, Oh, man, I'm not sure how we can do it. Well, I, I don't I said, Oh, we can do that. Well, whatever's we'll ready for you tomorrow or whenever. They. I believe, knew what they were doing. And there's no evidence that when they finished the ark and brought it before God that he said, that's not what I told you to build. And yet, what we're going to see over and over and over again is God is going to tell them, make sure you build it according to the pattern. Whatever pattern he gave them evidently was sufficient for them to reproduce what he wanted sufficient to satisfy him. And that's exactly exactly what you and I should be doing today. We look in the Holy Word of God and we see what He says and we ought to be compelled by our love for Him and respect for Him to 
reproduce as best we can in our lives what his word teaches us. That's exactly what we ought to be doing. Whether it pertains to the church itself, to the worship of the church, to the work and function of the church, or to my position in the family, your position in the family, how we're supposed to raise our children, everything, how we're supposed to live among our neighbors. We ought to be going back to the Word and saying, what's the pattern God has given me for living my life? And here's this circumstance in my life. How do I deal with this circumstance in a godly fashion so I know that what I'm doing, what I'm saying, what I'm thinking is pleasing to God. You think it's all in there? It's all in there. What did Peter say? Through knowledge of Jesus, God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Everything. So when we get into the Word of God, there's nothing left out. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, the Word of God is adequate and will make us adequate to every good work. There's not any good work that needs to be done that the Word of God won't equip us to do. That's the way the, the, the Word works. It's complete. It's whole. And so when these guys got the Word about how to make the ark, I'm sure they said, that's good. Let's go with it. Let's make it. And they made it, and God said, I love it. Carry it around for me. Bob. I'm, I'm sorry, there were other hands. Uh, Bob's one of them. There you go. Yes. Not well. It's it's been some years ago. Uh, Billy and Judy invited me to go with them to visit with some friends and uh, listen, sit in on a session of their bluegrass. I don't know how to, I can't hardly play a radio. These guys are endowed with ability from on high or whatever, but they can play. Lloyd back there can take a piece of board and he can shape it and make one of the finest bows you've ever shot. I wouldn't know where to start, and I've been shooting bows all my life. People have different abilities and skills. Some of you women, a lot of you women, you go home and, and there's nothing in your refrigerator, but you pull out stuff somehow and you make a meal and it's fit for a king. We've got these kinds of skills. Where does it all come from? Do we just learn it growing up or does God give each one of us something and then we work and develop that something and, and put it to use? I think that's the way it works. God gives gifts, spiritual gifts and otherwise, and it's up to us to do something with them. And we appreciate that people do that. I do. And I know you do too. Frank? Yes. Okay. Huh. He knew what he was doing. Sure. Somehow they, they understood these things. I remember reading uh, in World War II, sometimes in tank battles, they would especially, the Germans would especially do this because they knew we had a lot of stuff. They would fire and hit a tank, and if they disabled the tank with the first shot, they would keep firing at it until it was set on fire. Because 
even a tank, if it gets hot enough without that cooling, immediate cooling, then the metal gets soft and it's, it's no good to be used for spare parts for another tank. You can't, you can't refurbish it and put it back in battle because now the metal is softened and it won't hold up anymore under combat conditions. And that's why even when they disabled the tank, they'd keep firing until it caught on fire and burnt and they would burn hot with the fuel and the ammunition and things that were in them. But that's, that's just an understanding of how metal works. I don't know if you've ever done any reading or study about how the Japanese made samurai swords. You know how many layers of metal are in one thin samurai blade? It's like 75 layers, if I remember right. They would take that stuff and pound it out and fold it over and pound it out and fold it over and pound it out until they've got a, a sword that will literally lop off a head. And they're not big, thick, heavy swords. It's, it's just the craftsmanship that goes into them. They, they've got the, the metal, they've got the raw materials, and they work that stuff. They know how it's done. And this is, this is what God would do, I believe, in view certain people with skills, and those skills would be used. And we're reading this wondering how do they get that done, and they knew how to do it. God came to Noah, said, I want you to build an ark. I want you to use gopher wood. I want you to seal it with pitch. If you look at the dimensions of the ark, you and I would go, how, how many gallons of pitch? He's going to have to be making trip after trip down to Lowe's. He's going to run them out. He's going to have to order this. I mean, that's a lot of pitch. Big logs. How did he fasten them together? Did he have nails or did he just drill holes? Wait a minute, drill holes. How do you drill holes without a power tool? But did Noah make an ark? He made an ark. And it held up in the flood. He didn't put it in a pond. God sent the flood. And the ark held up in that flood for over a year. I mean, the, the rain was 40 days and 40 nights, but the flood, waters were on the earth, prevailed for over a year. So people knew how to do stuff. And even today, does technology today not blow you away? And I wonder, when is it ever going to stop? I remember being a kid and watching George Jetson. And they would, they'd get up and they'd turn on their screen and they would talk to one another, looking at one screen and see the person on the other. And I remember uh, Jane Jetson. That was her name, wasn't it? Jane? Yeah, George and Jane. Judy shaking her head. She's been watching the George the Jetsons. <laughs> she, remember she had that face. And she would put that face on. It's a cartoon, hey, you know. And we would watch that and say, well, that, yeah, that's, oh, man, that's the future. That's the jet age. Well, we've got that now. How many of you have ever Skyped? And now they've got another thing. Uh, it's not Skype. It's face-to-face -face or something like that. Just did it a couple of weeks ago. One of the kids had a phone that had that on it. Look, Dad, what you can do? And they called somebody that had that and and we're looking at them, and they're looking at us, and we're talking on this phone. It's outstanding just what you can do with technology. I got a little phone here. I can dial a number on the other side of the world right now. Just that. I don't even have to talk to an operator. This thing will, it'll, somebody will call me, and it'll ring, and it's not a party line. And somebody says, what's well, a party line? I think they ought to bring them back. That would be so much fun. Okay, you, you, and you are going to be on the same phone. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey. Could you imagine an, an MRI, somebody saying, we're going to take this big, huge magnet and put you inside of it, and it's going to give us pictures of your body. Oh, yeah, all right. Will it pull out my feelings? I don't know. It's, it's outstanding what technology can do and what people know how to do. Have you heard about this guy? He's going to go up to, is it 120,000 feet? Oh, yeah, miles. He's going to go up that far, and they're going to drop him, and, and they have figured out that on his descent to planet Earth, he's going to break the speed or the sound barrier. My first question is why? But the very idea, and 
And I thought, I don't know if this guy's going to survive it. Well, I did a little reading about that today. He's already jumped from over 100,000 feet. They've done test jumps, like 70, 90, 100, some thousand. And they've, they've been successful. It's just unbelievable. We've got a space station up there. We've got sat You go home and turn on your TV and your, your signal's coming from a satellite. It's orbiting the Earth. You get on your GPS and in just a matter of seconds it'll coordinate with exactly where your car is and tell you exactly where you are on the planet. Yeah. Now, see, we're, we're looking at modern technology. If, if we were to take this technology and try to show it to the people who built the ark, they'd probably go, I don't believe that. That's witchcraft. That's, that's magic or something. No, it's just technology. And then we would see the things that they would make and probably go, how in the world did you make that? Well, it's, that's just how we know to do it. That's our technology. We have this understanding of how this is supposed to work. We go back in the 1800s, if, if there was a nuclear war and we were put back to where we didn't have anything and somebody said, here's how we're going to make soap tomorrow, You'd say, you're crazy. But that's that's the way it works. Mike. We've we've forgotten spiritual things. This is all worldly technology. We need some spiritual technology. Thank you for your kind participation and patience, and uh, Lord willing, we'll come back next week to uh, finish up number 132.